your thinking. I'm going to repeat that. You change your life by changing your thinking. Let's turn to a very f familiar portion of Scripture, uh, Matthew, the 10th chapter. Matthew 10, I'm going to read through verses 29 and 31. Matthew 10, 29, reading from the Amplified Version of the Bible. Are not two little sparrows sold for a penny? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's leave or consent and notice. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So fear not, fear not then. You are of more value than many sparrows. It's just a simple thought. But if you really think about it, how many of you have ever seen a sparrow? Well, in Israel, they are very, very rampant. There's sparrows everywhere. They breed like rabbits, <laughs> but they're everywhere. There's all kinds of sparrows. They're all over the place. When you look at that verse of Scripture, beloved, as I have, and I've thought about it, and I've thought about it, and I've said, Lord, I believe your word is true. I believe your word is true. I believe everything in the Bible is true. And I, if I believe your word is true, then what you're saying to me and anybody else that reads the scripture is, if you care for one of those little sparrows that fall to the ground and you know every feather they have, you know, he also goes on to say he knows every hair on your head. And I've already prayed that scripture through many times. If you know the, the hairs in my head, then you know the ones I lost, you can replace them. <laughs> Seriously? He knows every feather. He knows every thought of your mind. And we need to see something in those scriptures. If he cares for the little sparrows, how many little sparrows are in your life? How many little people that, that don't seem significant to this world? But God says they're significant to me. That's right. And his church is supposed to be looking out for those little people. People that's been shunned by the world. People that have had hurts and wounds and all kinds of travesties travesties happening in their lives, either past, present, or future. You know, we need to be there for these people. And this is what he's saying. If I care for the little sparrow, how much more do I care for you? My goodness. My goodness. Jesus said, look at the birds in the air, for they neither sow nor reap, nor they gather into barns. Yet the head that your heavenly Father feeds them. He feeds them. And if your heavenly Father feeds the birds of the air, how much more will he feed you, his precious, beloved child? Because that's what you are to God. You are his precious, beloved child. Abba, Daddy, Father. I've told the story many times, but standing in an airport many years ago, in Tel Aviv Airport in Jerusalem was the first time I ever heard a little boy say this, or a little girl for that matter, but it happened to be a little boy. And he was tugging on his daddy's pants, going through customs, what have you, in, in Tel Aviv. And he was saying, Abba, Abba, Abba. And boy, it just went home. Just, you know what I mean? Just hit home. Because that's what God's saying to us. Just come to my throne. Just say, Abba, I want to hear my name. Abba, 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 Father, Father, Father. You know, I picture myself sitting on, on Daddy's knee. You say, Pastor, how can you say that's God? He's my Father. And I picture, just like my own dad, and if you've been raised in a, a good home, and if you haven't, God's your father, and you can still go on from things that you may have had to go through. But in a normal home, you know, for normal dads, 
You know, most babies and children are wrapped right around their little pinky. You know what I'm saying. But daddy, 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 please, please, please. And nine out of ten times, daddy will say, enough, I'll give it to you. You hearing me? And that's what Jesus is saying in these scriptures. You change your life when you change your thinking. When you see God as your father, as you see Jesus as your big brother, and you see the Holy Spirit as your guide through this lifetime, you change your way of thinking because you know how much God loves you. He loves you unconditionally. He loves you. You are his precious child. So you might say, well, why don't I see the supply then? Well, you may ask, the answer is worry for the most part. There's other things involved, but that is why Jesus also said, therefore, do not worry. How do you worry? He's told you how. He said, do not worry, saying, saying. You can think about being worried, but it's when you say it that you are, and every part of you will line up quickly with your words and your thoughts. So, therefore, do not worry saying. I want to share something with you today. The force of faith is released by the spiritual. Also, the force of doubt is released by the spiritual. Spiritual what, you might say? Spiritual law. The force of faith is released. The force of doubt is released through the spiritual law of two words. I say, I say, you say, well, well, pastor, what does that mean? You must open your mouth. I said this a few weeks ago. Do not shut up in the face of adversity. Open your mouth and do not speak doubt, but speak faith. It's faith that will release the power of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Everyone that knows him must come to him knowing that he is faithful and he will perform that which he said. Now, that's the law of faith. I say, but it's also the law of doubt. It works both ways, beloved. And unfortunately, I hear it more than the doubt than I do than faith. And I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about years and years of ministry. So, I'm trying to teach you something today that can change your life. This is a law. Just like, you know, um, you go up in, 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 a, in a, a top of a building and you, you, you say, oh, oh I, can, I can fly like Superman. Oh, yeah? Well, as soon as you fly, you're going to hit that ground and smash. Why? Because you violated the law of what? Gravity. Gravity. So there are laws in the kingdom. And the greatest law you need to know is I say. You don't be quiet when the enemy's attacking you. You don't be quiet when he's attacking your children, your finances or whatever. But it's what you say that's important. In yourself, you can't do a thing. But because of the laws of the Word of God, you can overcome through the Word of God, through the Word that says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthened me. God will supply all my needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I walk in faith and not fear. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I, I plead the blood of Jesus over my household. No, you will not have my finances. You will not have my health. You will not have my sanity. You will not have my children. You will not have my seed, seed, seed. Did you hear me? This is what it's all about. Don't roll over and play dead. That's exactly what the enemy wants all of us to do. But I'm here to tell you this morning. Faith is released by the Scripture. And fear is released by not knowing the Scripture. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, why don't I see the supply then? The answer is what Jesus said. Do not worry saying. Saying. So what shall we eat? What sh this is what Jesus was saying. You, he's repeating what they're saying. 
He said, what shall you eat? That's doubt. Can you get that? He's, he's saying, don't say this. Don't tell me what you shall eat. Don't tell me what you shall drink. That is the force of, 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 of doubt. Don't tell me what you shall wear. No, for your heavenly Father knows what you need for all of these things. He's already gone before you. He's already done it. Beloved, if your heavenly Father cares for these cheap little common birds, and that's what they were in Israel, the cheapest sacrifice they had was a sparrow. So if he cares for these cheap little common birds and feeds them every day, how much more does he care for you? Let your heart be at rest as you hear him say to you, do not fear, therefore you are more valuable than all of these sparrows put together. You are more valuable. Perched on a tree bench, or tree branch, excuse me, two birds were observing passers-by rushing from one place to another. And looking at their faces, one bird asked the other, why is man so full of worries and cares? And the other bird answered, maybe they don't have a heavenly father like we do. I believe that the Lord made birds to tell us that we are of more value than many birds put together. And here in Matthew uh, 10, 29, it says, Are you not, are two sparrows, excuse me, sold for a copper coin, a copper penny, a copper penny? He said, Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? If you do the math, beloved, you'll realize that these sparrows were so cheap that you could buy them, four of them, for two copper coins. And you'd get one thrown in free. And yet God valued those little birds that no one else valued. And there's plenty of little birds in our hearts. There's plenty of little birds in our neighborhoods. There's plenty of little birds in our workplace. There's plenty of little birds everywhere you go that God's speaking to you and he's speaking to me. Open your mouth and tell them of my love. Open your mouth, tell them of my greatness. Open your mouth and tell them of my provision. Open your mouth and tell them of my faithfulness. Don't close your mouth, especially when you're going through hell because it's hell that wants you to close your mouth. You open your mouth and speak the word and the word only. And that self-same hour, his servant was healed. Praise Jesus. As I said to you earlier, sparrows are, are, are common creatures in Israel. Yet not even one of these little birds fell to the ground. Not one of them without the Father's knowledge. Not one of them is forgotten by him. So will he forget you? No way. Those of us who are so much more, we're all so much more valuable than these, these people or these birds. But people, to God, there is no price. You can't put a price on a soul. Jesus Christ came and paid that price for each and every one of us today. Hallelujah. You know, as you know that I just came back from, from uh, a, a trip with my children and, and you know, I was on a ship for, for a week, and it was just an amazing time. It truly, in the sense that all I did was pray and seek God and talk to God and talk to people about God and witness for God, and I saw God move. One example among many was my daughter, Patty, came to me and said, did you see that woman, Mom, that was cleaning the rooms? Did you hear her? I said, no, what, why? She said, she's singing at the top of her voices, her voice, all these lovely old hymns and how great thou art and all these other things and the people in the ship just walking by smiling. I said, where is she? She said, oh, I figured you'd go find her. So she was down there and I went and I found her and her name was Anne. And I said, Anne, it's just nice to know that, you know, you're, you're a Christian and what have you. I got to talking to Anne and I got to pray for Anne and then I told her about my great-grandson. 
And then she's from Jamaica, and she was telling me, she said, Pastor, we pray all of the Jamaicans on the ship get together at night, and we have church. Because they don't have a pastor and what have you, you know, in the high seas, that's not there. But she said, we pray, and she said, I'll be taking that baby's name and praying for him uh, tonight, and we'll be praying for him till September. And these are the things that God does when you go first, you know, it's in blessing, I will bless you. He kept saying that to me over and over again. Every driver we had with every mode of transportation, I spoke to them. Some of them couldn't even speak English, but I got through to them about Jesus. And when I would say the name Jesus, it was amazing the drivers that were Christians. It was amazing when I talked to them about my great grandson. I'm, I'm a Greek Orthodox. I'm a Catholic. And they just kept going. And they were taking his name. That boy was getting prayed for all over the islands. I mean, it's amazing when I, when I think of what God will do for one of those little sparrows. Listen to me carefully, beloved. There's nothing that God does not see. Nothing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish up with these stories in a moment, but this is very important, the one I'm going to tell you now. Because God really proved to me, showed me something. In blessing, I will bless you. He spoke those words to me. But there was a young lad that would come at 7 o'clock in the morning. He couldn't get there every, every morning, but he, I had a room service for, I only wanted hot water for my tea. <laughs> and so he would come, and the first morning that he came, I, I gave him a track and a, a tip, and I said, here, son, this is for you. Well, when he saw you are special and realized he was from Indonesia, but he did speak fairly good English, he's learning English. And when he saw it, he put it like this to his heart. And he said, I just prayed this morning, madam. I just prayed this morning. Please pray for me. And I said, and I named him. I can't remember his name now. It's an Indonesian name, but I know I'll never forget him. And I said, what do you need, son? And this is really going to put a lot of things in perspective for many of us here. He said, all I want is to become a waiter in the main dining room because all he does is the kitchen working back and forth in early mornings from 5 a.m., whatever, with room service. He said, all I want is to become a waiter. And he was in tears. He said, and I prayed this morning that God would give me this. He said, I have to set a test, an exam. I said, what kind of an exam, son? And he told me he'd have to pass this to be able to go to the next level to be able to become a waiter up in the main dining room. I said, you already passed. And he went, well, oh, thank you, thank you. He just believed it. <laughs> no doubts, no. Yes, yes, I passed. Yes, I said, you passed. You telling me? I said, I'm telling you, you passed. And I prayed for him. I laid my hands on him. I prayed for him. Tears streaming down his face. I tell you, we used to have a saying in Scotland, we'd have brought tears to a glass eye. And I'm not kidding. Some of you will get that later. I'll explain it to you. Anyhow, so that was fine. That was great. The last day, he didn't come in the morning. He didn't come. It was another young boy. And I said, I've got to say goodbye to him. Lord, you've got to show me where he is. I had such a bonding with this kid. It doesn't always happen that way. But that was just one little sparrow. I'm trying to say something. One little sparrow can change the world. He can go back to Indonesia and save a whole nation for all I know what God's going to do with him. But I called room service and I told them his name. Oh, he's not working room service today, madam. He says, they said, he's in the restaurant, uh, the buff, it's a buffet restaurant, and he's doing all the, the kitchen work and stuff. I said, I'd like to be able to talk to him. Can you send him to my room? No, madam, I'm sorry. We can't send him to your, your room, but you could go to the restaurant, and maybe one of the supervisors can help you. There's a point to what I'm telling you here, because God goes before you. When, you, when you're thinking about others instead of yourself, it's amazing how God shows up. So I went to the restaurant, 
Nobody knew who he was. There was, some, there was quite a few of these young boys had the same first name, but not the same last name. And I was thanking God I had brought his last name. Well, all of a sudden, these three men show up in front of me in the hallway. My grandson David was there, witnessed the whole thing. Two of them were dressed like supervisors with the gold pins and the whole thing. And the man in the middle was very, very well dressed, but he wasn't one of the supervisors. So I just went through my whole thing, and they said, well, why do you want to see this boy? I said, it's really simple. I don't want to make a big thing of this, and I certainly don't want to get him into trouble. Oh, no, no, madam, that won't happen. But we're asking you, why do you want to see him? I said, I just want to bless him. Well, you could have heard a pin drop, literally. Their eyes stared at me. What do you mean? I said, I just want to say goodbye to him and bless him. I said, he was such a beautiful young man. I said, and may I say something to you? You're in positions of leadership. I said, one of the greatest things you could do for this cruise line is to get that little boy up in that main dining room. I said, he'll be a great asset to you and this cruise line. Well, <laughs> the, one, the one supervisor said, well, we'll see what we can do. I said, he's already passed one test. She's, he says, then they said, they said to me, did you know him before this cruise? I said, no, sir. I only met him now. I said, but I know the goods when I see them. Well, at this point, the man in the middle puts out his wallet, takes out his card, and he said, here, madam, I want you to have this. And I thought, what is this? So he gives me his business card. I said, thank you. What is it for? He said, I'm going to tell you what it's for, and I hope you don't forget it. That was his words. And he told me his position on this particular cruise line. And all of the ships on this cruise line, he, he does this over every one of them. And I won't go into all those details because I was shocked. He said, I'm giving you this card because I want you to know that if you ever use this particular cruise line again, you or your family, or your family alone, I don't care who they are, if they mention your name, my business card, this is it, all trimmed with gold trim. It was beautiful. And it said his, his, his uh, home number, um, all these numbers and emails and faxing and texting. He says, you make sure you tell me before you get on board. And I'm standing there, and as this man's talking to me, all I could hear was the voice of the Lord, in blessing, I will bless you. I did not do that for the acclimates of man or for anyone to see me. I wanted to bless that boy. The next thing that came out, I said, well, I don't understand. What do you want me to call you for? And he said, you call me, or you get a hold of me, and you will have the best table in the dining room, he said, and you will have anything you want on that ship. And I've got my grandson to witness what I heard. He's, and I said, oh, thank you. And I'm trying to kind of, yeah, I said, oh, thank you. But no, he says, I don't think you heard me. He says, I mean it, madam. I mean it. Now, what was that? That was God touching that man's heart. Because that man saw that I was trying to bless somebody to get nothing in return. There's nothing gives me greater pleasure than to minister when we would, Pastor Dave and I would go away. With all these little sparrows. And we'd take an extra case with us to these places we would go. And it was filled with stuffed animals and tracks and all the other things. Because these people can't give back to you. They don't have anything to give you but their prayers and their love. I'm trying to get something across to us this morning, beloved. When we come here on a Wednesday night to pray, when we come here to pray for Theodore, when we come here to pray for the needs of the church, listen, God sees everyone that walks in those doors. He knows you. And believe me, when the time comes when you need prayer, God will have people there for you. And that's what he showed me with this man that was above these two supervisors, above, literally above, close to the captain on the ship with his position. Little did I know 
what may or may not come out of it someday. But I do know this. God spoke to my heart to do it, and I obeyed him. I get none of the glory. All the glory goes to Jesus Christ. All the glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, oh, I did. That's the end of the story, and this is the funny part. He's walking down the aisle, the, the hallway, and he had another two supervisors with him. And is that the lady? And he said, I think so, I think so. Because you have to understand, when he saw me at seven in the morning, it wasn't what he saw at six at night. <laughs> <laughs> With a hair stuck up in a night, you know, a dressing gown on and what have you. It wasn't the same person. And he comes up, Madam, Madam, you look so beautiful. <laughs> I said, it's the hair, honey, it's the hair. <laughs> but anyway... Right in front of those supervisors, that boy just hugged me. And these men just stood there looking like, <laughs> we ain't seen nothing like this before. But it was God. It was God. And of course, I got his email. He got mine, all of these things. And we, I only took a few moments because I knew that he had, he had to be back at his, his job. But that young man will never forget that. You think what you do is not important? I'm telling you, it is. It is important. In fact, Pastor Joe, didn't you touch on sparrows in your message? You touched on a, didn't you, did you touch on a sparrow in your message last week? No? It must have been something I was reading or listening because I asked Bob the same thing. I heard somebody say something about a sparrow. Oh, well, it might have been the Holy Ghost. Let me say this to you. The greatest things in life are not things. Now that's that's a, a revolution in thinking. As you think in your heart, so are you. The greatest things in life are not things. Real joy, real peace, and purpose are found in Jesus. No storm can take him away. Even the little birds know that. And we need to know it in our hearts, beloved. Life is built by a series of choices, not by a series of chances. We choose every day what we are going to think. We choose every day whether we will say unto that mountain, Be thou removed. And be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. These are choices we make every day. But if you say to that same mountain, I doubt if you're going to move. I've been praying for so long, and I don't know if God can hear me. Keep, keep it up. You're going to get the results of doubt just like you get the results of faith. You must choose every day to control your thoughts. And believe me when I tell you, this is the place I'm at in life right now. Well, as many of you listening to me are, this is the place I have to train myself to control my thoughts. You change your life by changing your choices, you change your choices by changing your thinking. Hallelujah. Abraham knew this principle. The great Abraham, the man of faith, he knew, and that's why he could call those things that be not as though they were. Like many before him and many after him and many that will come, Abraham kept and maintained an attitude of faith. How did he do this? By guarding his thoughts. He, Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. I'm going to be starting probably in another two weeks in a series of hope. And it's going to be, it's going to be life-changing because we don't make enough of hope. Hope is the substance our faith is the substance of things hoped for. If we don't have hope, the substance is no use to us. Okay. The evidence of things not yet seen. There are just two positions in life. 
One is belief, and the other is unbelief. We have the privilege as Christians to choose one or the other simply every day. It comes down to this. The Word of God is either true or it's untrue. I believe in my heart that we are always believing something. Something. We're believing something. We are either believing the Scriptures or we are believing the voice of the enemy, Satan, by name under my feet and under yours. We are either allowing the word to have final authority or we are allowing our circumstances to have the final word. This doesn't give us a lot of latitude, does it, beloved? As you can see, there's no neutral ground. God's word must always be first. God's thoughts must become our thoughts. I have the mind of Christ, and I have to speak the word only. The good news is that Jesus has created you and I with the capacity to believe him. You know, blessed are those who believe that have not seen. That's us. We will see our faith when we, we go through the pearly gates, so to speak. When our spirits leave our bodies and we're present with the Lord, we will see our faith will be full then. But right now, we see through a glass dimly. We don't see it all. God doesn't choose to show us it all, but he chooses to be with us through it all. It's just that simple. And he will not leave us. He will not forsake us. So the good news is that you've been built inside of you as a believer is that capacity you and I have that God-given capacity to trust God completely, to trust His promises. If we were to stop and think about it, believing our circumstances has always resulted in fear. Come on now. It's resulted in fear, or it's resulted in anger, or it's resulted in confusion. What a wonderful opportunity all of us have today. This is the only day you have. And what a wonderful opportunity you have today the opportunities to start your day by making a decision to simply take him at his word and to allow his promises to have the final say regarding every area of your life, spirit, soul, and body, financial, your home, everything. Just continue on, beloved. Continue on and maintain the attitude of faith. Love people and trust God. And remember, the battle is in the mind. I'm going to be wrapping this up in a few moments. Many people make resolutions and get set goals, and I'm one of them, and I know many of you are, at the beginning of a new year. How many can say amen? Come on. January 1st, you're going to lose the weight. You're going to get out of debt. You're going to, you go on and on. And guess what? By January 10th, it's all gone. After a few weeks, many of the things that you tried to say you'd do failed, if you're honest about it. Why did you fail to really change? Because you're trying to do it in your own ability. But I've got some good news for you. It's not too late for you to make this year a much better year than it's been so far. The Lord checked me um, while I was having some quiet time with him about my attitude on this year because it certainly hasn't been what I've wanted it to be. But instead of saying it's been the worst year of my life, I've changed my confession. You see, we all miss it. And when we obey God, we correct it. Am I the only one in here? You're real quiet. Is it you're quiet because you're getting it or you're quiet what? Are you getting this? So when I, when I went finally, the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, no, I want you to confess this isn't the worst year of your life. This is the best year of your life because I'll have more miracles than you've ever seen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. But I had to be corrected. I know none of you have to be corrected. I'm talking to the wrong church. The key 
to changing old habits for new ones and replacing failure with success lies in what we leave behind. In Hebrews 12, 1, we read, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so does easily beset us and let us run. Now, here's the key. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, let me tell you one thing about your pastor, and I'm telling you from my heart. When you, if you line all the gifts up from here to China, I'm at the end of the line for patience. Even my daughter, Patty, when we were gone uh, two or three times, she came to me and said, Mama, I want to say this respectfully, and I knew what she was going to say. <laughs> Whenever any of my children say, I want to say something respectfully, I'd catch my breath. I said, I know, I have need of patience. She said, yes, mother, you definitely, they're laughing here in the front row because <laughs> it's the truth. My idea of patience is done yesterday before I asked for it. So I get very impatient with, with, when it's a lack of service or people are late or things like that. It really bothers me. Because when we say we're going to do something, we should do it. When we say we should, we're at a certain timetable, we should be there early to make sure that, that, that we're there on time. All of these little things, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. And we need to be responsible in little things, and then he'll make you ruler over much. And so, you know, when, when I would see things, and uh, people would be late, and we'd be waiting for this, and waiting for that, and then bad service here or there, which wasn't much, but I just have to work on my patience. Is there anyone else has to do that? Yes, yes. A couple of honest people at the back there. Hallelujah. <laughs> there are things that will limit your success, your victory, and your joy. And I want to tell you today what they are. Lay aside all of the weights. Lay aside all of the things you know is not God. Lay it all aside. Leave them behind so that you can run the race that God has planned for you. Before you can leave these things behind, you need to stop and meditate on this truth. Listen carefully. God has plans for your life. He wants you to know joy. He wants you to experience victory. He wants you to live in peace. That's a big one. That's a big one. Because we don't know what peace is until we don't have it. You know, on my sister Christine's um, stone at the, the cemetery, her husband Vince wrote this. It was an old saying of my father's, and he employed that to himself, and he put it on her headstone. You never miss the water till the well runs dry. Isn't that the truth, beloved? You don't know what peace is till you don't have it anymore and value peace. And that peace comes through the Prince of Peace. His name is Jesus. He's the one that said it, not Pat McKinnon. He said, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, I give I you. I give you my peace. My peace that will pass all understanding of this world. You hold on to my nail-scarred hand. I am the master. I am your, your, your husband. I am everything you need. I'm your kingsman redeemer. I am your God, and I am the God that healeth thee. I sent my word to heal you. He hasn't changed. Hallelujah. So we have to meditate on the things that are good and pure and lovely, of a good report. When you have a thought that comes to you that's an evil report or a thought of negativity, what does counteract it with the word? When you you know, when you say, oh God, how am I going to make my rent this week? And I'm not making light of this. But I've heard testimonies for the last 40 years of people at the midnight hour. God showed up with the money. If he can put the money in the, the, the mouth of the the, the, the fish, 
he, he, can, he can do it for you. If he can use the, the, the black, what was it, the crow? What was it, Elijah? The, Elijah with the bird. The raven, thank you. The raven with the bread, he can do it for you. He can do it for you. He's not, he, you can't put God in a box. So what do you do when you're thinking these things? Whether it's, oh, will I ever be healed? Oh, will I ever see this miracle? Oh, will I ever have this financial blessing? Oh, will I ever, oh, will I ever? Well, you heard Pastor Joe's testimony. This I do remember him about God getting you out of, totally out of debt from an un, you know, foreseen source, person that gave you a check, paid it all, and a car. Did anything else? You may, maybe need to lay hands on me, okay? <laughs> Rub that on me. I'm teasing. But I'm trying to say that God is not in a box. We, we tend to think he is, but he's not. So take hold of the new. You can't take hold of the new, beloved, until you let go of the old. You can't run the race looking back. You must learn how to let go. And how do you do that? By putting something else in its place. So when you say these negative things or think these negative things, come right back with the, the medicine, so to speak, with the injection, so to speak. Just like, shoo, inside of you. No, no. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. No, no. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. No, 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 no. I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. I am healed. He sent his word to heal me. I'm, he said in his word to put him in remembrance of his word. So I'm remembering you, Lord. I'm remembering your word, and this is my confession. When you start to counteract the negative thoughts and the negative speeches by the word of Almighty God that can never fail, God's word keeps this universe in space. He cannot fail. But when you understand that, you only understand it through one way, beloved, and I'm closing. You understand God's faithfulness to you. You understand that God will always be there for you only through one understanding of the Bible, how much he loves you how much he loves you. When you understand that that's your daddy and you're his precious child and you get into your little spirit and you don't let anything take it out, you'll see the hand of God move. Because you're not believing in a person Thank God for everyone that prays for us. Thank God for the phone lines. Thank God for all of that. But when you start to worship God and praise Him and enter into that secret place and worship Him and praise Him and worship and tell Him how much you love Him and He'll tell you back, I know, child, I love you too. I love you too. I know what you're going through. I love you. I know the situation. I love you. Just praise me. Just believe me. Just give me thanks. Hallelujah. 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 There are ways of thinking, beloved, that cripple us and keep us from stepping in to God's purpose and will for our lives. Leave them behind. If you don't, they're going to haunt you, they're going to chase you, they're going to hinder you, they're going to oppress you, they're going to terrorize you, and they're going to torment you. And next week, I want to pick it up here because I have three things that you must leave behind to have the freedom to change your life for the better and enjoy God's very best. I'll touch them and then I'm closing. One, and I'm going into this in depth next week. One, First, you may, must lay aside all manner of unforgiveness. Two, the second thing you must leave behind, what I call the disease to please. And the third thing, and finally, we would have to set aside guilt. So next week, I'll continue with this. In Jesus' name, I'm done. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Ghost.
Thank you, Holy Ghost. Every head bowed, if you can, every eye closed. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, I give you the praise and I give you the glory. I give you thanksgiving. You are a good God. You're an awesome God. You're a faithful God. Oh, yes, Jesus. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God that changes not. Thank you. As I've spoken your word today, Lord, these people's hearts were prepared. They've heard your voice. And a stranger they will not follow. And I'm asking you now as we close this service, oh God, if there be one here, just one, or even more, but even that one little sparrow, that one little sparrow, if you do not know Jesus as your Savior, he's reaching out to you today. And he's telling you that you are special to him. You are precious to him. And he wants you to know him in a relationship, not as a religion, as a relationship. And if you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I would like to pray for you. If there's anyone here that would raise their hand by saying, please pray, Pastor. I've never made that final decision to Jesus, and I want to today. I don't know if there's anyone at all, Sandy. I don't know. I'm just making sure. Okay? Thank you, Lord. Then I believe that all of us are saved, healed, delivered, and set free. Would you say this with me today? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I'm going to take that word, and I'm going to apply it to my everyday life. I thank you for the anointing on your word, and I give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's stand to it.